If you have your Bibles this evening, we'll be in Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3, as we begin a series of lessons of No, it's here somewhere. There it is. A series of lessons titled Build Below the Baseline, Developing the Part of Your Life That Only God Sees. Shoring up the salvation or the foundation of our faith. Very important for us to be able to do. And the place that we start with, with that, is having a relationship with God. The first step in building the foundation of faith is to have a relationship with God. More than a just saving relationship with God, not only, not only a relationship of salvation, but something much more intimate, much more personal, much deeper than just the salvation experience with God. Many people believe the salvation experience is the last step of faith. No, it's the first step of faith. And we must realize and understand that. The Apostle Paul understood this as his desire was to have a very intimate relationship with God. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 10, The Apostle Paul tells us this. He says there, his desire was that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might, ha any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, neither were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Looking at relationships. What is the greatest relationship that a person can have in their life? Well, come to answer that question, there are some people who would say that a relationship between parent and child, or mother and child especially, is the greatest relationship in life. How many of you had teenagers? Was that the greatest relationship time in your life? No. Struggles and trials and tests along the way. That come with that relationship. Some would say it's the relationship between a husband and wife. Greatest relationship of all time. Well, for me, that's my second greatest relationship. Because those relationship, that relationship tends to have an end at some point. Whether it's through divorce, which is unfortunate in our society, but still plagues our society. Or even if someone is married for 60, 70, 75 years or more, eventually the marriage bond is severed by going through the valley of the shadow of death. Because when we get to heaven, my wife and I will be brother and sister, not husband and wife. The Bible makes that pretty plain. Christ teaches that pretty plainly. So if it's not those two relationships, and it's not the relationship with your dog, which can be a very treasured relationship, What is the greatest relationship in life? It's the relationship we have with God. That is the greatest relationship that anyone can have in life, and that relationship will last 
forever. And there is nothing that could ever break up that relationship once it is established. My print here is a little small, so I have to make a spectacle of myself. Salvation gives us the most wonderful relationship of life. Because when someone receives Christ as their personal Savior, new life is born in them. Thus, thus the term being born again. Thus, as the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We are new from within, and that new from within comes out that people may see. And this relationship, this relationship of salvation can never be taken away or lost. It is a relationship that changes our, not only our life, but changes our eternity. So I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. I was headed for hell, lost in my sin. And I would have spent eternity there had I not given my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, I will live eternally with him. And the glories of heaven changes my eternity. We don't really think about that a lot, but it's absolutely true. But not only does it change our eternity, but this relationship with Christ in salvation has the potential to change our immediate lives and does. Salvation means that we are declared righteous before God. Go back to verse number 9 there in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3 and verse 9, the Bible tells us there, and be not, and be not found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. When we come to know Christ as our personal Savior, we have and take on God's righteousness upon ourselves. We are clothed in His righteousness, not our own righteousness, because our own righteousness has no worth in the sight of God. Isaiah makes that pretty, pretty, plain, pretty plain in Isaiah 64, where he says our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. In our court system, especially if there's not a jury trial, a judge will drop his gavel and declare his verdict on the defendant. Likewise, the Bible tells us God is our judge. And when we come before him and we stand before that judgment seat of Christ one day, we are declared righteous if we are saved. For those of us who have accepted Christ as our atonement for our sins, God declares us righteous by the merit, not our merit, the merit of his own son and his shed blood. We are made the righteousness of God in him through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the righteousness we have. And we stand in as believers in Christ. Jesus said in the Gospel of John chapter 15 and verse 5, in that first phrase there, he said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Something we should always be reminded of every once in a while. You have to be reminded of our, our place. Christ is the vine. He is the giver of life. We are the branches that are grafted into the vine that we may have life through him. And particularly in the culture of that day, one would have understood the significance of this agricultural illustration and parallel. 
A branch without a vine would soon shrivel up and die. Likewise, without Christ, we have no strength or ability to be able to bear fruit for the Lord. The last part of that same verse there in John 15 and verse 5, without me, ye can do nothing. Salvation also makes Christ our cornerstone. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 19 through 22, the Apostle Paul uses this analogy as he writes to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God, through the Spirit. A Christian has the advantage of building his life on the solid foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The old hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Last, that was written by Edward Moat, adequately states, On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And the amazing thing about many Christian lives is that we have mastered the art of giving the illusion of success. You know, kind of like when you go to the airport and you go through this and you go through security. It's the illusion of security. It's not really security. You go to the airport at Israel, you go to an airport in Europe, and you have armed people with machine guns. That makes me feel more secure. <laughs> and we give off we give off in our Christian lives the illusion of success, all the while ignoring the foundation that has been designed by God to support the structure of our lives. And if the foundation is faulty, what happens to the building? It falls, right? If our relationship with the Lord is faulty, what happens to our relationship with God? It's not right. It's possible to have the appearance of growing in Christ, but have a crumbling foundation underneath. In a place called Pisa, Italy, it is the home of the well-known landmark, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You've all seen pictures of it, probably. Though this tower draws tourists from all over the world, it is actually an embarrassing display of the ramifications of a faulty foundation. Construction of the Tower of Pisa began in 1173. It was built in soft soil, and it was given a foundation that was less than 10 feet deep. Even before its completion in 1372, it's a long time to build a tower. Its infamous tilt was noticeable to the naked eye. The inadequate foundation was too unstable to support such a large structure. From 1990 to the year of 2001, the tower was closed to the public while a $25 million project was conducted to stabilize the structure and reduce its lean. But even after these 11 years of reconstruction, the lean was only able to be reduced by 16 inches. 
Millions of people make their way to the Tower of Pisa to gaze with awe at the phenomenon of such a structure. But every day we cross paths with souls whose structures are just as much in contradiction to functionality as that of the Tower of Pisa. It doesn't matter how much effort you put into constructing a successful life. If we only take care of the outside and do not put effort into the part that no one else sees, which is the foundation, our demise will eventually become obvious. The foundation of relationship with God it's mentioned there in our text in verse number 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. When the Apostle Paul wrote this as moved by the Holy Spirit of God, he was not speaking of a casual knowledge of God or of simply knowing Jesus Christ as Savior. Many Christians today think that's all you need. During the great church age that we had back in the 70s and the 80s, that was the great emphasis of the church, getting people saved, which is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. But they got people saved and they got people baptized so they could get them on the church roll so that their churches could be growing and never discipled them in the faith. Just threw them in the pool without teaching them how to swim. Well, you know, I guess you learn pretty quick if you're going to float how to do something. <laughs> Doggy paddle, something. If not, you'll sink. Paul was speaking of an intimate and deep knowledge of God. That word there in the verse, in verse number 10, that I may know him. That word know used there in the passage means to understand, to grasp, or to ascertain, especially to be familiar with or acquainted with a person or thing. It is to really know Jesus in an abiding relationship. And we need to know Jesus Christ in an abiding relationship. Not just a casual relationship, but something that's more intimate, more substantial and concrete, if you will. And in verse 10, we see three ways of knowing Jesus. And the first is to know his person, that I may know him. This kind of knowledge of Jesus Christ is far more than intellectually knowing about Jesus, reading about Jesus in history. It's knowing him personally. And we have the opportunity to develop a relationship with him. And knowing the person of Jesus Christ means that we spend time with him. How do we get to know people? We spend time with them. And that we are sensitive in obedience to the Lord's voice. That we set aside time to be able to know him. Religion alone is satisfied with ornate rites and rituals, with its systems and its regulations, its lists of do's and don'ts. And is willing to pass these off as knowing God. If you do these things, then you know God. But a Christian ought to desire to know Christ intimately and personally. And one can know the biblical boundaries and spiritual preferences 
of the Christian life and yet not know Christ. There are people that are, go into churches, they're members of churches, they've been members of churches for years. They look the part of a Christian. They pray the part of a Christian. They tithe the part of a Christian. And pastors really love that. They do everything, if you will, like a Christian. And yet they've never trusted Christ as their personal Savior. They're religious, but they're lost. Do you know him? Do you know the sense of his conviction when he speaks to you? Are you attuned to God speaking to your heart through his Holy Spirit? Do you know when he is burdening your heart to spend more time with him? Do you know the prompting of the Holy Spirit to share the gospel with someone? This is knowing Christ. This is the beginning of an intimate, personal relationship. In Ephesians, back in Ephesians chapter number 1, and verse number 15, Through verse number 18. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Consider, if you, were, if you will, these words by the... One of the old preachers of the past, Dr. F. B. Meyer. We may know him personally and intimately face to face. Christ does not live back in the centuries nor amid the clouds of heaven. He is near us, with us, compassing our path in our lying time and acquainted with all of our ways. But we cannot know him in this mortal life except through the illumination and teaching of the Holy Spirit. And we must surely know Christ not as a stranger who turns, who turns in to visit for the night or as the exalted king of men. There must be an inner knowledge as of those whom he, who, whom he counts his own familiar friends, whom he trusts with his secrets, who eats with him of his own bread. Our Lord and Savior, a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. We should worship him as king? Yes. It's important. But can you not be friends with the king? Sure you can. And we can be friends with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. The author of Paradise Lost, John Milton, accurately stated, The end of all learning is to know God. And out of that knowledge, to love and imitate Him. That's a true statement. 
When a man and his wife have been married for a number of years, Brother Jerry and Sister Sandy know all about this. They've been married for a number of years. They know by instinct their spouse's likes and dislikes. The husband knows what kind of flowers his wife loves, her favorite restaurant, and exactly how to brew her coffee. I don't know if Brother Jerry brews the coffee at home or not. but And the wife knows her husband's routine, how he likes to relax after work and his favorite sports teams. We would think it strange if a married person didn't know anything about their spouse. But knowing, knowing one's spouse isn't developing merely isn't developed merely by being married. It is gained by spending time with each other. With each other, It takes communication and making it a priority to get to know one's spouse. Knowing the person of Jesus Christ is just like that. Spending time with them. Getting to know them. Being familiar with our Savior through his word. Speaking of his spirit. If a Christian can be saved for a number of years, but still does not know Jesus personally and intimately, there's a problem in his foundation. Eventually, the structure of that Christian life will crumble because no investment was made into building this foundation. We are to know Christ's person, that I may know him, and know his power, and the power of his resurrection. The Greek word power there is the word dunamis, where we get our English word dynamite. It's, it is a life-changing power that comes through the Spirit of God living within us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you and me. And yet, we walk around so powerless. Holy Spirit is within us. All we have to do is engage. The electrical wires are in the wall, right? To get the power, the electricity... You've got to plug in. Then your toaster works. How many times have you used your toaster and it wasn't plugged in? This is a toaster. Oh, that's why my toaster doesn't work. You plug it in and it works. Same way with the power of the Holy Spirit of God. I have heard people say, well, you know, the power that was there in the first century church, that power was extraordinary and miraculous. And it was. And it cannot be duplicated today. They're wrong. The same power of the first century church is available to the Grace Baptist Church of Neodoshe, Kansas today. Same God, same spirit. Same word, same gospel, available today for us. So we have no excuse not to succeed in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. All we have to do is plug in to the power of God. It's amazing what God would do. If we would just do that. And here we see that Paul states he wasn't content with, to merely know about this power. He wanted to personally experience this power. He wanted to know the fullness of God's power. And that should be our desire as well. 
In the book of 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, and in verse number 3. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3. According to his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. According to his, God's, divine power. He has given us everything that we need, everything pertaining unto life. And godliness through the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of God that hath called us to glory and virtue. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, as Paul speaks to the church at Corinth, there in verse number 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul did not go to the Corinthian church to be able to give men's philosophies. He didn't give them great oration. He gave them Christ. Christ crucified. Christ buried, Christ risen again. In demonstration of the spirit of God and his power. That their faith would be in the power of God. Not in the wisdom of men. Too many Christians depend on the world to build their faith. Ah, they're building on the wrong they're building with the wrong material. They need to build with the material that God provides. Below the baseline of each of our lives, there must be God's power at work. We ought to be personally experiencing. A manifestation of God's power working in us through our relationship with him. We need to know his person. We need to know his power. And next time, we will pick up is that we need to know his presence with us. I appreciate your time and attention tonight.